Hello everybody, welcome back to Growling Anvil Studios. Project today involves this Conso servo motor for industrial sewing machines. On the left you can see the switch. Uh, I'm playing around right now dialing in the speed on the control unit. And that little motor on the right is the, uh, the actual motor, tiny little thing. When it came in the mail, I was... Uh, I had I had serious doubts about whether it would have the the power it needed to have. I, I've had some experience with these little DC motors. I've got one on a, a little mini lathe, and um, boy, when you are going slow speed, it uh, it's nearly impossible to stall. You, you grab onto it and it, it'll just slow right down. It just seems to get more and more torque um, as it goes slow, which is perfect for sewing machines. Um, all of the machines now have big industrial motors on them, big clutch motors. All right, so here's a close-up of the motor. There were no instructions with this thing at all as far as mounting goes. The little sheet of paper there on the right that you can just see, that was uh, some instructions on how to use the, the motor control, but there were no instructions on how to mount it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, this bracket allows the the motor to slide back and forth. So the machine on the right is a Singer 111 uh, cylinder arm. The machine on the left is a FAF double needle, and that's the one I'm going to be setting up. So I dragged it out and um, just dropping the switch off the table. And then here I'm unhooking the um, treadle from the clutch motor. You can see the difference in the size of the motor. The, uh, that three-phase clutch motor is um, quite a bit bigger. All right, so here's the FAF. Uh, just unhooking it, taking the head off the table. I haven't done any cleaning or anything yet with this. Um, I got the... Um, the um, Foot, the walking foot lifter, the presser foot, uh, has a chain, uh, has a lifter there. That, that large spring across the top is the spring tension for the presser foot. And the bar that runs uh, along the back, that, that, that massive bar, is the mechanism that we can see it there lifting the uh, presser foot. And, uh, boy, there's no, there's no lever to lock it up, to hold it, so it's just under pressure all the time. And it was a tiny little hole that I had to reach up into to unhook it and uh, just eventually use this little uh, pick, a little curve like an O-ring uh, pick to reach up in there and get it off. Get that out of the way. All right, so in the course of this um, conversion, I made just about every silly mistake you, you could make. And uh, here, I, I just cannot figure out how to get this insert off. I'm just not seeing it. Um, you know, it turns out there's a little catch, and there's a little catch in the back, and when you unlatch that, it slides right out. All right, so um, I can't figure out how to get this insert out. And I make numerous mistakes during the um, conversion here, and I thought that'd be kind of a neat thing to talk about, you know, um, with all of the different projects I do, in all the different mediums that I work in, um, I've just gotten really comfortable with the idea that, you know, I'm going to screw up. Uh, there's going to come a time in almost every project where I, I just realize I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, and I think that feeling never, never really goes away. At least it hasn't for me. I, I don't know, you know, and, and, and for a lot of the people that I've talked to um, that I respect and, and look up to, um, you know, it seems like it never goes away for them, for them either. Uh, but I can't speak for them. I can only speak for myself. And I can tell you that, um, you know, I, I really enjoy being out on the edge, uh, of the trade of what I know. Um, you know, that's where the, that's where the fun stuff is. And, and so here in this case, um, you know, one of the ways that I deal with screwing up and, and uh, messing up 
is I'll just fall back to something that that's enjoyable and that I like doing. I'll just change my focus a little bit. So here I just couldn't get that top out, that insert. I just can't figure out how it comes out. Um, yeah, I looked at it and, and uh, I just couldn't just couldn't come up with the 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 um, the method. I've never taken one out before. I thought maybe it lifted out and the weight of the sewing machine would hold it on pins or, or hooks or something like that, but that wasn't the case. It looked like it just slid in, uh, but boy, I just couldn't figure it out. So what I did was I just went to uh, clean it. Um, and in the course of cleaning it, I, I found a little catch in the back and you undo that catch. It sort of was sort of hidden under the motor and you undo that catch and sure enough, it slides right out. So the, the uh, tactic, you know, is when I screw up, when I mess up or I can't figure something out, I'll just move to a different, I'll do what I know how to do. Um, you know, I start with what I can do and I'll just start doing what I can do. And, and, um, you know, pretty soon I'm, I'm pretty soon I'll be doing what I didn't think I could do, you know, or what I couldn't figure out how to do. I don't know if that makes any sense, but, um, you know, the, the, I guess the basic thing I'm trying to say is when I'm lost, I just, um, you know, I just try and try and find a little trail of breadcrumbs. I don't really think about where I'm going or what the problem is. I'll just totally change tactics. Uh, you know, I just started cleaning this thing and by cleaning it, uh, that's, that's how I found the catch. Um, while I was, you know, just, just while I was cleaning it is when the, is when the catch made itself apparent. All of this trim is broken. So I'm just removing it, pulling all the nails. It's all junked up. I'll probably cut some wood. That was all like a plastic trim. And I'll probably cut some wood, um, to fill in there. So just dusting everything off and being, being a little cautious because, um, with something like this, you just never know where a needle has gotten hidden. You don't want to just blindly, you know, wipe something down and catch a needle right in the, right in the finger. All right. So there's that big, massive three phase clutch motor by far, um, the heaviest part of this, of this machine. Um, it's got a, a bracket there, and then there's just one little cotter pin to pull here, and uh, that comes right out. I'm also kind of digging this film style. You know, I've been not really thinking about what my film style is. Um, I'm just documenting what I do, and I, I'm going to let the style take care of itself. And uh, I, I got a little bit more comfortable this time. It didn't. I didn't really showcase it. The next video will probably show it off a little better. Um, but I kind of just came up with this this style where I just keep the camera around, and then I just move it and and just put it where I'm focused. Um, if I'm all over, you know, I'll have a have a a wider pan. If I'm close, I'll, I'll zoom in. Um, I'm just physically moving the camera around with me and uh, kind of. I kind of okay, so uh, just out of frame on the left is my uh, forklift, and I just keep it in the shop. I pull it in. You know, I'm in the Northeast, so everything has to be inside pretty much six months out of the year anyway, uh, up here in upstate New York. Um, so I pull it in. I just keep a pallet on the forks, and then I put those on the car jacks. There's that catch in the back. Um, we're looking at the bottom of the table, back of the hole, and there's that. There's that um, little catch that was hidden before. I, I realized I moved that catch, and then I, I realize now I can probably move it back. But um, you know, this again is just I'm just playing around. This is the first conversion I've done, and uh, I just wanted to play around and see what. see what I could get done with it. So here I'm just mocking the motor up. I'm just putting the motor kind of where it's going to go and just make, looking at everything. All right, so I can see this bar is in the way. This was the bar the motor was mounted on. And I'm just going to lower it down. Looks like I'm raising it, but the table's upside down, so. 
just going to lower it down. I'm going to keep it. I might be able to use it to mount some stuff. This block right here it will mount the uh, motor control on the right side of the table. So it's just one screw uh, through holes in the table. Um, I, I don't know that I really like it. It's kind of it's kind of odd, you know. Again, I'm just mocking this up. I'm just I'm just seeing which of these tables I like best. I chose this one because it's the only one that that fits the insert. All right, I could I could cut any tabletop and and make them fit the inserts, uh, but this one also has the smallest footprint and. While a big table is nice, um, one thing I've really learned having so many different uh, facilities and areas to work on things, I really try to keep the footprint of everything as compact as I can. Um, so this is the smallest of the tables. So there's the motor mounted. You can see the control on the right side. I did try mounting that control up under there. Um, just to, I thought I could keep it out of the way, but I, I really couldn't. I couldn't. So I had to move it. So that's actually the second mount. The first mount was up underneath, and that didn't work out. Uh, that was another way that this thing fought me. And there, what you saw me doing there was leveling it out. I actually found a way to, to make this table taller. Um, you can see the slots. It was down all the way in the lowest position. Um, so you can see the um, the slots there. Now, this insert went all the way in. Um, didn't affect anything, and nothing hit. And I, I thought that was pretty good, so I went ahead. But um, here I'm moving the catch which I'm probably going to move back. I ended up having to move the motor over uh, about three and a half inches because the geometry just wasn't quite right, and it's still not quite right. That's one of the reasons I, I want to keep that bar, that, that motor, that bar the motor was mounted on. Um, I may come up with a platform. I may, I may just come up with a platform that mounts on that bar that I can then just put all of this stuff onto. Uh, the insert has a knee lift for the presser foot. I don't need it with this machine, so that would save me some room. Uh, but I think a platform would be a little easier. It's kind of funny because you don't really think, I mean, looking at them, there seems to be a ton of room. Um, but the geometry of everything, it, it, while not critical, I, I didn't want to pull at an angle on the control for the servo motor and they don't give you uh, much wiggle room and so I was about uh, an inch or so out and I just didn't like the way that it put drag on the belt so I ended up changing it I ended up moving it moving it over you can see this top is riddled with holes um, and it's also uh, attached with four hex head um, not hex head, excuse me, um, Allen head um, countersunk bolts. So I might just make a new top for it. It's I, I didn't feel guilty at all about poking holes in it because it's just riddled. It's like a like a piece of Swiss cheese. During its time in the factory, they just mounted all sorts of things to it. So next thing on the list is the presser foot lever. And I just cut a piece of a coat hanger and made a, uh, a real crude split ring, like what you would put your keys on, just to, just to um, again, work out the geometry. I just want to make sure everything's right. Um, so I found a scrap piece of that, of that chain and uh, used it to extend the um, presser foot chain. Of course, the reason I had to do that is uh, because I raised the table, um, raised the table height so I could get my knees under it. Luckily, the um, the connecting rod here, the little pitman arm, 
the connecting rod for the switch uh, is quite long. I, I didn't even have to extend it. It's very, very long, and it, there was enough. There was plenty there to even give me a low treadle, um, even having raised the table up. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, I do not like this geometry. Uh, just using my tape here as a little bit of a gauge with my marker to get a line off the the center of these heads, just eyeballing the center. And this is going to allow me to uh, move this unit over three and a half inches, which I think will be nice. All right, so I went off to lunch, and um, after lunch came back and got back at moving this, this motor. Um, you know, I could never foresee all the problems, um, but, you know, I know that I can work it out. So it doesn't ever, uh, doesn't really ever frustrate me. Like I said, you, you know, I'll stop and clean. I'll go to lunch. I'll do something just to, um, just something I know that I can accomplish and accomplish well. Cleaning is my go-to. You can always oil tools or sharpen things or do something that, um, you know, is, a, is, is good for the shop. But um, really only took me, you know, maybe 10 minutes to move this motor over. And as you can see, there's so many holes in the top, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. So here I'm just measuring along these the lines that I gauged, three and a half inches each. Uh, double checking, and then uh, pop the new holes in. So with the new holes in there, we um, drop the bolts back in, and remount the motor in its new position. This position still isn't ideal. I may, um, as I mentioned before, I might just use that bar to build a platform here. Uh, there's just no way, this motor's so small, and the pulley, everything is so small compared to the other motor. There's just no way to keep that belt from rubbing. This definitely helped. Um, it definitely helped. It gave me a little more swing. I can run, you know, it, it runs now. There's no good way uh, to prevent that belt from rubbing if you, if you mount on the table back here. Uh, you just have a narrow space to work with, and the insert itself is very, very thin uh, in the area where the belt runs by. All right, so I'm all set up and ready to stitch. Um, I'll walk you through my philosophy here, uh, how, to, how to thread these things. Some machines you can find good instructions for online, and, you know, if you can find... If you can find good instructions, then by all means, use them. Uh, you, you come up out of the spool. You want to go through that hook. So you're pulling up off of the spool. And then you enter into the thread post. Uh, front, back, side to side. You can try it um, top to bottom, and you can try it bottom to top, depending on if your thread isn't straight enough. Some, some machines have thread straighteners. Then... There are these um, eyes on the faceplate. This machine has two because it's a double needle machine. A single needle machine only have one. So I go over that roller and down around the tension ring and then over the top of that little post. When there's a little post on your tension discs like that, you're supposed to go over the top of it. You then always have to go into the check spring. You always have to go into the check spring and generally pull up uh, enough so that your thread goes into the hook and then there is a at the top of the check spring. See how there's those and two I little hooks? That, that now under here, I'm doing a bad job of pointing it out have, because my I mean, camera skills are poor. Uh, uh, but in a minute, it'll come. There it is. Under there is a little hook. And I don't generally see those hooks. And if you notice all the grunge and grime and dirt, I decided that probably no thread had ever gone in there because it would be clean if it had. So I just left that out. Uh, and then go into this guide up through the take-up arm that's uh, critical there'll always be some sort of a take-up arm that's um, what tells the needle you know how much 
how much thread to make a loop basically uh, takes up guide, takes up the extra the down through all the guides the, um, and there's a little guide some have guides by the needles some don't you know, generally my rule of thumb um, if there's a guide a, go through it, if it has a, a, and as far as needle placement goes you know some are left to right some are front to back some are right to left um, here's my rule of thumb the the set screw will be on the flat of the needle that will orient your needle um, and then you look for the long groove and just thread it from the long groove side to the other side a lot of industrial machines go left to right and this one is no exception this one goes left to right so um, that should get you threaded and you can always give it a try and just turn it by hand if you feel a lot of resistance or, or something doesn't feel right, uh, you know, stop and clear your thread. Figure out what's going on. You don't want to reef on these machines and uh, just just power them. Even a little piece of thread down in there can can throw it out of time or hurt it. You know, if it gets jammed in in, in the bobbin area. Um, so here I'm ready to sew, and you know, this machine has been a little bit fussy. It's it, it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. I've spent all morning on it, and you know I've made every mistake in the book from mounting things in the wrong place, um, you know, mounting things. Um, not not really. I didn't I didn't mount anything uh, wrong or backwards. Like I didn't screw up any of the mechanics of the parts themselves, but just the geometries, uh, all kinds of geometry problems. You know, I put I put brackets on I didn't end up using, had to take them off. All of that leads to this moment when when you get to run this test test stitch and see a machine uh, stitch for 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 the first time for you. It's pretty neat. It's, for me, you know, it's pretty it's pretty neat. So the um, I love the control of the um, servo, and you'll notice right there that uh, it stops stitching. <laughs> Believe it or not, as you can see, one thread comes out. Believe it or not, all of that. And I never did check the bobbin. And <laughs> this son of a gun from the factory, after all these hassles, this little thing had about two and a half inches of bobbin thread in it. And it just never occurred to me to check the bobbin, you know, which you do at the outset of a project. Um, but I figured, I figured it would be enough. So it had about two and a half inches. It stitched two and a half inches in the, and the uh, bobbin gave out. But that'll teach me for test running it without the bobbin winder on it. You know, I thought I could get away with it. And uh, this little thing got its revenge. It wanted its bobbin winder. So I did get some stitches on there. I, I can't see them. I couldn't see them forming. Now that I watch the video, I, I know where they are, but I couldn't see them forming as I was sewing. So I'm looking around for the stitches. <laughs> All right, so you guys know what's next. Putting the uh, bobbin winder on here. I'm just fiddling with this motor. I, I still am not real happy with the geometry of this motor. I'd love to move it forward. And on a standard table, I could. Um, but the fact that this table has this insert in it, that's, as, that's about as close as I can get it. So I may end up making a, a bracket off that bar after all. So we put the bobbin winder on here. And um, I also could shorten that belt up. Um, I did make up a belt for this machine. I shortened it because of the existing belt, I should say. I shortened the existing belt because, um, of course, the clutch motor is much bigger and hung much lower, uh, which is what, what gave you the proper geometry to clear all the, all the edges and pieces, parts. Um, I didn't film the making of that belt because I had a lovely visit with uh, the gentleman who was a mechanic in this factory, working on these machines uh, from the 1950s on, he started in the 50s and um, 
worked there at a at a shop before it was the shoe factory, and then he got laid off for a couple of weeks while when that factory closed, and then when the shoe factory moved in, he he took up he took up uh, working at the shoe factory, and from cutting floor supervisor to machine mechanic, he worked on all these all these machines, and we just had a lovely visit and I chatted about sort of what he did and what. Um, you know, turns out his his folks had a a hotel right down the road from me. You, what you're seeing here is me just absolutely failing at running this bob and winder. Um, I did finally figure it out. Um, I just wanted to wind up enough to try this machine out. <laughs> I, think I was so surprised that it ran out of thread like that. Uh, that. Uh, you know, so I'm just looking at the bobbin case here. I'm trying to figure out which way uh, the thread would go and how it would go in the bobbin case. And I think I got it. And I put it in there. Get it all uh, threaded up again. And uh, get ready to give it a shot. And I pull up, I'm not real happy with with the way it's pulling up the bobbin thread, but it did pull it up. It did pull it up. And, I, and you know, in my experience, if it pulls it up, you're good to go. So I thought, huh, well, it's getting it. All right, let's go to work. So I put some work under the foot. I go to sew and just lumps and bumps and crunches and thumps and uh, nothing but trouble. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. So I try again. It's just as bad. It's not making stitches. And the top thread's getting stuck. So it turns out that when I was winding that bobbin, the um, thread had somehow gotten pulled out of the take-up arm. I didn't realize it was whipping around that violently. I, I thought the end of it would, would stay kind of put, so I didn't even think of that. Um, but once I threaded it back to the take-up arm, it, it stitched beautifully. Um, here you can see I'm just fixing some Velcro on these boxing gloves, sewing new Velcro on, and you can see uh, back tacks, back tacks wonderfully. And the machine has needle feed, so this kind of a job with the Velcro, it just cruises right through because um, where, like, my 1591 won't feed the Velcro, just slips on it. Um, this machine, the needle pierces the work and then feeds it, so it works great. Thanks for watching, guys. Um, we'll see you next time.